I can just see that right now. Uh, with that, I would love to introduce Susan Gilliland, who will introduce our guest speaker tonight. Susan. Thank you, Ron and Mark. Um, Ryan, I warned you about this, all those jokes. So, but we're really happy that you, you decided to come and speak with us tonight. We're happy to have Dr. Ryan Terrell. Ryan grew up in Santa Cruz, California, and has been a birder his entire life. Ryan received his BS in ecology and evolution from UC Santa Cruz and his PhD from Louisiana State University, where he studied the evolution of mold strategies in birds. Ryan is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Moore Lab of Zoology at Occidental College and is working on molt in the Mexican monsoon and the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project. He's also on the California Bird Records Committee and is editor for the photo section of Western Birds of the Journal of Western Field Ornithologists. So please welcome Dr. Ryan Terrell. And before Ryan actually starts up, I just wanted to mention one quick thing. Uh, please use the Q&A if you have a question for Ryan. And if you have a general comment, uh, please use the chat. And with that, Dr. Ryan Terrell. All right, great. Thank you so much, Susan and Ron and Mark. Really, really appreciate the kind introduction. I'm going to just make sure that everything's set up here. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so today I'll be talking about the evolution of molten birds or evolutionary interactions of feather molten birds. And specifically, I'll, I'll mainly be talking about my research over the past few years into this subject. So when we're talking about molt in birds, Ron mentioned that a lot of things molt, which is true, but outside of birds, molt is really ectysis, which is the shedding of the outer layer of skin. And in birds, when we're talking about molt, we're talking specifically about feathers. And uh, so there's a few things that it helps to you know, establish about feathers when we talk about molt. Um, feathers are something that we really think of as connected with birds today. The only animals alive that have feathers are birds. Uh, we now know that feathers evolved pretty early in what we call the archosaurs, which are the birds, dinosaurs, and uh, pterosaurs. Um, and lots of dinosaurs had different kinds of feathers, maybe, maybe some pterosaurs did. Um, but now birds have lots of feathers. And, and lots of different kinds of feathers. And, and, and feathers have really helped birds over their evolutionary history. One thing about feathers though, uh, is they're really lightweight, which we all know, but because of this lightweight um, structure of feathers, they break down pretty quickly. And in fact, in, in about a year or so, feathers break down to the point where they're not really useful anymore. So you can see this skua, these outer feathers are they're really braided, they're really worn, and they're getting to the point where they're not necessarily going to be able to provide the lift that the skua needs to fly to find uh, its food. So if you look on the inside, of, in fact, I can turn my cursor on here. Um, inside of the primaries right here, the first couple primaries, this bird is growing in new feathers. So it's beginning the cycle of molt, where it's growing and uh, replacing these, these old worn feathers. One thing about molt is that it's, it's it's really been understudied as far as avian life history characteristics go. So if we look at sort of the, maybe the three main things that birds do in a year, which may be migrate, breed, and molt. Um, migration and breeding have received quite a bit of attention over the years. This is just mentions in, in Google books. And molt has received almost none, which is kind of kind of interesting because, you know, maybe a quarter to a third of the species on bird, of birds on earth actually migrate. And breeding, not every bird breeds every year. Uh, birds can skip breeding, birds can skip migration, um, but birds really don't ever skip molt. Um, so it's really important for birds and it's a fairly understudied subject. And so the, the main questions that I'll try to get at or try to talk about in this seminar um, are, why do different birds have different strategies for molting their feathers? And what are the effects and consequences of these molt strategies, especially with an evolutionary perspective? So a couple of things to um, establish uh, when we're talking about molt is just what molt does for feathers. So what, what does molt do for feathers? Um, molt, like we saw with the skua, it can work for structural renewal. Um, so just, you know, replacing uh, Sorry, I'm just toggling my video here. So just replacing worn feathers. 
Um, but MOLT can also serve for phenotype alteration. So by phenotype, I just mean um, the outward appearance and structure. So does the color change? Does the shape or length of the feather change? Or does the pattern change? So MOLT, in addition to renewing feathers, it can also potentially change what a feather looks like or does. And what does molt require? Molt requires food, it requires resources. Birds need to eat food kind of above their uh, baseline energy consumption rate to grow feathers. They're basically just putting stuff into these feathers. Um, and it also requires that birds can, uh, can lose the function of a feather during molt. And I don't mean entirely. So this, this ruddy duck is molting all of its wing feathers at once. And so it is losing flight. Not all birds do that but at least the feather that's being molted, it falls out and a new feather grows in its place. And so there is some functional loss while molt is happening. So when we look at molt strategies, I'm talking about different ways that molt varies. So how does molt vary? Molt can vary in pace, just how quickly a feather grows in, uh, maybe extent. So molts, they can be complete where all feathers are replaced or partial where only some feathers are replaced. Um, timing when molts happen, how long they take, how many happen in a year, and pattern. So what is the order with which feathers are replaced during a molt? And I'll be going into each one of these kind of in more detail throughout the talk. So going back to this first question, why do birds have different strategies for molting their feathers? Why do we see all this variation in molt? One of the things is that feathers serve a lot of different functions for birds. So when we talk about birds needing to replace feathers at different times a year, we need to think about what birds are using those feathers for. So feathers do all sorts of things. So here's just an example. Uh, this, this little figure I took from a, a manuscript I went on with Allison Schultz, who I think is talking in the next seminar or in a seminar coming up on the functions of feathers. Feathers are good for waterproofing. They protect each other from the sun. Uh, things like woodpeckers use them for bracing. They're good for mimicry that number or letter D there is a baby Cotinga um, that mimic, they mimic toxic caterpillars in the nest, which is, which is only recently discovered. And it's a super cool phenomenon. It's, it's really the only instance that we know of what we call Batesian mimicry, which is when something mimics something else that's toxic um, in birds, which is super cool. Um, work for flight, feathers are good for camouflage. They're good protection. So ravens have, you know, a lot of birds have these bristles over their nares so that the bugs and stuff don't fly up their nose, supposedly. Um, they work for signaling, like with sexual signaling. Um, and hummingbirds and feathers can produce sounds. Um, and there's all sorts of other stuff. When we're working, this paper that I'm talking about, we're working on is just kind of documenting all the functions of feathers and talking about their evolution. I think we came up with like 29 different functions we could think of um, that feathers do. Um, and, and one important thing to remember is that feather function varies both among species and individuals and within species and individuals. So, you know, a, a, a sandpiper and a hummingbird and in, um, an ant pitta may all be using their feathers for different things. But if you just take that sandpiper or that zebra finch and look at all the individual feathers, those individual feathers are doing different things as well. And those feathers may have different jobs throughout the year, even the same feather. So feather function varies but it varies in lots of different ways, what we would call hierarchical ways, between species, among species, between individuals, within individuals, even within the same feathers. One cool thing about all these different things feathers do, sort of the functional diversity of feathers, is it's really helped birds conquer the world. The fact that birds can, feathers can keep birds warm and keep birds cool has allowed birds to live in the middle of the desert and in Antarctica or in the high Arctic. The fact that birds can fly long distances without using much energy means that birds, you know, can use a huge amount of the ocean and migrate really long distances in search of food. And I think one of the, one of the things that, you know, I love about birds. And I think one of the things that gets a lot of people into birds is that, you know, you can go outside basically anywhere in the world and, you know, the most visible animal is going to be birds, you know, whether you're in the middle of the jungle or you're on, in the desert or in the ocean or in a city or or whatever you know birds are birds are just everywhere and part of that is because they can use their feathers in so many different ways you know when you think about snakes you know i don't get all the way up to alaska and frogs are restricted to certain areas and stuff and birds birds really don't have those issues and it's because of feathers um but throughout the world 
resources, they vary spatially and temporally. So when I talked about birds need resources, they need food to grow feathers. This may be something co contributing to why birds have different strategies for molting their feathers, because food is not equally distributed throughout the world. So going back to these main questions, why do different birds have different strategies for molting their feathers? And what are the effects and consequences of these strategies? To get at that, I wanted to take an evolutionary approach. And this is a quote I'm sure everybody's seen another number of times um, from Theodosius Dobzhansky, who is one of the main architects of the uh, modern synthesis of evolution. Um, and he said that nothing biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And uh, it's a great quote. It's really cool. But it, it's, uh, to me, it's really relevant to this talk because when, when I showed the little bit of research that was done in the mold, the vast majority of it has been pattern based, which is really important, but it's a lot of it has just kind of been documenting what molt patterns are out there. You know, this species does that, this species does that, this species molts at this time. And there has not been very much research into molt from an evolutionary perspective. And in my mind, that's really important um, to try to understand molt. Um, I see a question pop up. Um, I, will, I will address all the questions at the end or as many as I can get to. Um, and so my research during my PhD and ongoing, one of my main goals is try to try to find an evolutionary perspective for molten and try to put what patterns we see in molten and birds into an evolutionary perspective. So my approach is to study interactions between birds' phenotype, their life history, their ecology, and their molt strategies in an evolutionary context. So this is kind of breaking up into four parts, which is three of my dissertation chapters and one of my current postdoc projects. So uh, the first part will have to do with patterns of molt. I'll talk about extent and timing of molt, and then pace, and then I'll, I'll talk about molt migration. So first part, molt patterns. This is based off a paper that um, recently came out in uh, American Naturalist, which I was pretty proud of. It was pretty cool. It was years uh, to finally get this out, but this has to do with molt patterns. So uh, how feathers are replaced or in what sequence and order feathers are replaced um, and how that relates to the evolution of, of flight and flightlessness in birds. So flight we think of as a key innovation for birds. Um, birds, you know, lots of things fly, dragonflies fly, bats fly, sugar gliders kind of fly, um, but everything but birds are, you know, they're pretty, everything's bad at flying pretty much compared to birds, right? Compared to a peregrine falcon or sooty shearwater a bat is terrible at flying. Um, and that's really been important for birds. Um, like this peregrine falcon is able to pursue an American goldfinch and live on catching birds in flight. Whereas, you know, there's no other predator that's fast enough to, to catch birds in flight. It's allowed birds to develop these long distance migration strategies. It's allowed albatrosses to, you know, go, go between Hawaii and California to, to get food for their young. It's been really important for birds. But flight has been actually been lost quite quite a bunch, quite a number of times in birds. Um, often in the absence of predators on islands and remote lakes, um, but we've known for a long time that some lineages lose flight more often, more rapidly than others, um, especially things like rails um, and ducks. And the question I wanted to get into with this is, is there something about these groups that predisposes them to lose flight? So we have these few groups that have lost flight a number of times and a lot of groups that haven't lost flight. Um, what is it about these few groups that have lost flight a lot of times? And then the, the key here may be their style of primary molt. So when I talk about style of molt, um, sorry, the most common style of primary molt is sequential molt where birds just molt one feather at a time going out of the primaries. Most birds do this, this Western gull is doing it and they do it so that they can maintain flight ability. You know, they don't drop all their feathers at once. Big birds will have multiple lines of molt going in the wing, like this brown pelican. You can see all the different places feathers are growing in. Um, and then some birds, about 3% of all species do uh, what is called a simultaneous or synchronous wing molt where they molt all their wing feathers at once and they, and they completely lose the ability to fly uh, during molt. And some examples of these are grebes, loons, rails, ducks, uh, geese, swans. And in fact, to kind of drive this point home, Snow geese do this, and there's this paper, this paper is from like the 50s or 60s, called Techniques for Mass Capture of Flightless Blue and Lesser Snow Geese. And by flightless, they just mean molting. And the technique is you just built, put a fence around them. 
they can't get away because they're they're completely flightless during molt. And one thing, interesting thing to point out about simultaneous wing molt is actually it's a retention of a juvenile trait. Uh, so really, all birds grow all their feathers in at once. So this this ant shrike here is growing all its feathers in at once, not because it does it's one of the species that does simultaneous wing molt. It's because it's a baby, and all baby birds really grow in their their juvenile feathers at once. So simultaneous wing molt is just retention of this trait into adult cycles. Um, and changing the timing of developmental events falls under the broad tent of what, what we call heterochrony, um, which Stephen Jay Gould called nature's laboratory for morphological experimentation, because small changes in the timing of developmental events can potentially lead to really large changes in the adult phenotype. So when we think about these salamanders that retain their ancestral gills into adulthood, they can go from a terrestrial air breathing adult with lungs to an aquatic adult with gills, which over evolutionary time should, you know, if they were to evolve that trait de novo or, you know, from the new could be millions or tens of millions of years, but simply by retaining their larval gills into adulthood, they can undergo that evolutionary transition extremely quickly. And that's why Gould called changing time developmental events or heterochrony nature's laboratory for morphological experimentation. Large changes can occur from very small tweaks. Um, so going back to flightless birds, uh, when I wanted to look at the evolution of flightless birds, uh, I encountered one problem and that was most flightless birds were dr driven to extinction by humans. So we now think of flightless birds and aside from penguins and rays and ostriches that fly, lost flight a really long time ago, but birds that are in groups that now fly like ducks, like grebes, but are have flightless species, we think of them as really rare. Like we go to New Zealand and oh, I saw the, the flightless rail in New Zealand, right? You know, I saw the flightless steamer duck in Patagonia, you know, it's like this cool, weird thing. But there were a lot of flightless birds. So, so Dave Stedman, who's a paleontologist at Florida, who's actually my wife's PhD advisor, he is a paleontologist that work, works in the South Pacific. And he has found in every fossil site he's been to in the South Pacific, pretty much, he's found a different species of extinct flightless rail. And so he thinks pretty much every island in the South Pacific, maybe every oceanic island in the world had a different species of flightless rail at the minimum. And some of them had some flightless grebes and ibis and other stuff. And, and when you extrapolate that, that comes out to a fifth to a quarter of the world's bird diversity was flightless before humans expanded around the globe. You can imagine when people get to an island, they're starving, you know, they've eaten all the food in their boat and there's these big flat, plump, flightless birds that aren't afraid of them. So, um, you know, what happened to these birds? Uh, the great auk is a great example of an extinct flightless bird. The dodo, the Stevens Island wren was this bird that lived on Stevens Island off New Zealand. Uh, the entire species was eaten by one individual cat. It was the lighthouse keeper's cat. Um, there's also this cool bird called the long-legged long bunting. It's the only, it's the only flightless uh, passerine outside of the New Zealand wrens that we know of, which is pretty cool. It's, it's in the genus Emberizus, so it's in the same genus as the rustic bunting, but it had these big, long, strong legs and it was flightless. It's a pretty cool bird. Um, so yeah, Stedman guessed that loss of flightless birds may exclude 2,000, in, may exceed 2,000 species, which is a lot. So flightless birds used to be pretty normal. Now, number of flightless birds is, you know, one parrot, a couple of grebes, some ducks, a cormorant, a bunch of rails. But if we include just species that went extinct in the past few thousand years, it's way more. Um, and when we look at species that are extinct that were flightless, that have non-simultaneous or simultaneous molt, I told you that birds with simultaneous molt make up about 3% of species in the world. 3% of the species in the world. Flightless, when you just look at flightless species, it's almost 70% of them. So birds with simultaneous molt are way outsized. So my guess was that adaptations for survival during a flightless molting period. So when birds aren't able to fly, they still need to find food and they still need to get away from predators without flying. So the adaptations that they evolved to find food and get away from predators without flying, things like having bigger, stronger legs, living out in the middle of a lake, being able to hide in reeds, those may function as pre-adaptations for a flightless lifestyle when they get somewhere where flightlessness is favored, like a remote island. So my approach to test this idea was to look at the rate of loss of flight over 
over evolutionary trees of birds. Um, when loss of flight was preceded by simultaneous wing molt versus not preceded by simultaneous wing molt. So what we're looking at here is just an evolutionary tree of all birds. Um, I say just an evolutionary tree of all birds because we don't have the one real answer to evolutionary the what the evolution of what the evolutionary relationship to birds are, but we have a, a lot of good guesses. And without going into the nitty gritty, um, I did this analysis basically over all of the possible good guesses. And so this is just one, one example of a good guess um, informed by a lot of data of the uh, evolutionary relationships of birds. Anyway, in red, we see birds with simultaneous wing molt and those black ticks outside of the red are flightless birds. And you can see there's a lot of black ticks on the outside of the red and not that many within. And when we look at these evolutionary rates, and sorry, these five different plots are five different types of tree sets. So each plot is a thousand trees. So we're looking at, at results from 5,000 trees. Um, but what the important thing is uh, the black distribution is the, the rate of loss of flight. And in fact, it's the log of the rate of loss of flight of loss of flight preceded by simultaneous wing molt. And then the gray is loss of flight preceded by non-simultaneous wing molt. And it's kind of confusing because the black and gray are switched on the wings, but, um, and there's a log rate. So basically the takeaway from here is that groups of birds that have simultaneous wing molt lose flight way faster and way more prolifically than groups of birds that don't have simultaneous wing molt. So the simultaneous wing molt seems to facilitate rapid loss of flight possibly by pre-adapting birds for a flightless lifestyle. It's certainly not the only path to flightlessness. There are species of birds that are flightless that don't come from groups with simultaneous wing molt. The dodo is a great example of one. Um, the Galapagos cormorant is a great example of one. Um, the kakapo. But one interesting thing about all these species is they have pretty deep evolutionary relationships to the their closest relative that can fly. So the closest relative to the dodo that can fly, which are probably the crown pigeons in New Zealand or New Guinea, maybe, are separated by mil tens of millions of years from the dodo. Whereas if you look at the brown teal in New Zealand, there's actually one subspecies on one island that can fly, one subspecies on one island that can't fly. And in fact, all these rails um, and all the ducks and all the grebes that can't fly, they're most close related species can fly. So every single one of these flightless birds is an independent origin of the loss of flight, which is pretty cool. If we just look at the grebes, there's three grebes that are flightless. There was one in, in Colombia that's extinct now that was sister to pied-billed grebe. So it lost flight. It looked exactly like pied-billed grebe. It hasn't been separate that long. Um, the one in Peru is sister to silvery grebe. It looks a lot like silvery grebe. And, and uh, the one in Lake Titicaca is uh, sister to a white ear group. So they're all independent losses of flight, which is pretty cool. But in these species that don't have simultaneous swing molt, they seem to be really more distantly related to the species that can fly. And I, I just wanna highlight another paper. This wasn't my work, but it was really cool. And it came out right when my paper was coming out. In fact, I, I reviewed this paper and I was asked to review it as mine was about to come out. It was really exciting because it, it ties in what I was doing with, with dinosaurs, which is like awesome. So this is the first paper, the first documentation of, of molten dinosaurs, which is like, it's just so cool. I don't know, it's like the two coolest things coming together. Um, anyway, so I talked about how birds with simultaneous wing molt, they need to avoid predators and they need to find food without being able to fly. And so that means they generally live in aquatic environments. They generally hide in reeds. They generally, you know, live out in the middle of the lake. Well, this early Paravian dinosaur um, clearly seemed to have been fossilized while it was an active molt. And the molt was not simultaneous. The molt was synchronous, which means it was probably relying on flight throughout the year. So one of the big questions at different points in history is how, how did feathers function for early avians, Paravians, dinosaurs? Well, at least in this species, it seems like they were so reliant on flight that they had a, a non-simultaneous or a sequential style of molt, which is, again, the dominant style in, in, in birds today, so that they could fly year round, which is just 
you know, it was like 70 million year old fossil. I don't know. It's so cool. I wish I had been part of this, but I'm very, very excited about it. So something that kind of ties in and shows where we can, the more we know about mold, the more we might be able to potentially infer about the lives of birds, both today and in the past. So moving on uh, to timing and extent of mold. And this uh, is based around a, a chapter of my dissertation that I recently published with my collaborators, Jared and Glenn. Um, on in the journal Ecology and Evolution on the evolution of breeding plumages in birds, um, specifically in, in the New World Warblers, which are a favorite group of a lot of ours, at least mine. So this chapter had to do with the evolution of pre-alternate molt. So I just want to explain what pre-alternate molt is really quickly. So pre-basic molt is just a complete molt every year. We call that pre-basic strategy. And there are a lot of birds that do that. They just do one complete molt every year and that's it. And some birds also do a partial molt. So they do a complete molt, then a partial molt, then a complete molt, then a partial molt every, every year. They do two molts in a year. That partial molt is called the pre-alternate molt. And a lot of us may think of it as the breeding, breeding plumage, even though it's not necessarily the breeding plumage. For example, in ducks, the pre-basic molt is the bright plumage that we think of the, as the breeding plumage. And then the pre-alternate molt is that dull brown plumage that we call eclipse. Um, but in scarlet tanagers and, and warblers and stuff, that pre-alternate molt is the breeding plumage. So we wanted to ask how this breeding plumage evolves. And the conventional wisdom is that there's different regimes of selection throughout the year, right? So when birds are not breeding, the strongest pressure on their feathers is probably hiding from predators. So they need to be more camouflaged. Whereas when they are breeding, there may be relatively stronger pressure to find mates. And so they may have a brighter plumage. And this differential selective pressure throughout the year may lead to the evolution of two molts a year so that birds are able to change colors throughout the year. So we wanted to ask, does pre-alternate molt evolve for phenotype alteration? or for structural renewal. Going back to the beginning when I asked, what does molt do? It can change colors, but it, it can also just renew um, worn feathers. So we studied this in the New World Warblers, um, which are really good because they've got a diversity of life history strategies, migratory strategies, molt strategies, colors, um, and, and whether or not they molt. And, and just to kind of show this, there are some species that have no pre-alternate molt at all, like black third blue warbler, just they do just pre-basic and that's it. There are some that have a pre-alternate molt that doesn't result in any phenotype change. So like water thrushes go through a pre-alternate molt, they do some molt on the head and back and, and chest, but you wouldn't know it because the feathers look exactly the same as, the, as, as in basic. Um, there's some that go through a, a limited pre-alternate molt, like a Canada warbler, just does kind of the head and chest and back, maybe some covers. Um, and then there's some like chestnut west side warbler that looks like a completely different species. And in fact, some species, not warblers, but like black bellied plover was originally described as two different species, you know, the, the basic plumage and the alternate plumage because they look completely different. We scored uh, the extent of molt and extent of di dimorphism, I mean dimorphism as in differences in what they look like throughout the year, kind of across the bird, we just broke the bird up into regions and looked at it over an evolutionary tree. So this is a, a, a evolutionary tree of the relationships of the warblers. And a couple of things to notice here is that, so we have the tree and then lined up is the different uh, feather regions going from the head, which is the most commonly replaced in pre-alternate mold to the most rarely replaced in pre-alternate mold. And actually my own, my own head is covering that up for me and the secondaries, which are like never replaced in pre-alternate mold. So, Pre-alternate molt is pretty well spread out through the phylogeny. It's not like there's just one group that does it, right? And, and a bunch that don't, or some that do and some that don't, right? It, it's well spread out through the, the phylogeny. And, but it's not really even across the body. It's most common in the head, the breast, the belly, the back, some coverts. But then by the time you get to the, the rectrices, the primaries, um, the big wing feathers, especially, it, it's actually pretty rare. And one thing to point out about the extent of pre-alternate molt that we've kind of known, but we, we found really good support for in this study is that it's pretty strongly related to migratory distance. So birds that migrate farther do more extensive pre-alternate molt. So at the top is just a, a simple relationship. You can see it's a pretty strong positive relationship. 
But all those plots on the bottom are just within each section, how many species do or don't replace that section in pre-alternate molt versus how far they migrate. And so, and we found that pattern repeated in every single uh, area of the bird. So the head, breast, back, belly, median coverage, every, every feather region, that same pattern holds up where longer distance migrants tend to replace that uh, region in pre-alternate molt compared to shorter distance migrants or non-migrants. One interesting thing about migratory distance is that there's a really strong relationship between migratory distance and day length. So birds that migrate farther experience longer days over average throughout the year than birds that don't migrate at all because they have a really long summer and then they have the kind of long winter, but they don't go through the short winter. Um, and in fact, you know, black pole warblers at the north end of the range, you know, it barely gets dark in the summer. So you think about the difference between a, a black pole to yellow throat in Mexico that basically has 12 hours light and dark all year compared to a black pole that has that in the winter, but then in the summer they have, you know, they have light for like three months, and gets a little dusky, you know, in the evenings. So why is pre alternate related to long distance migration? Um, well, it seems that the feather regions related to migration are the upper parts, the head, the coverts, and they're all the areas that are most exposed to the sun, like when a bird is perched. And we know that solar radiation is is pretty much the number one driver of feather wear. That's why we keep birds. If you go to a, a museum of natural sciences, all the collections are put away and they're closed, right? There's not that much that's out in a display. And even the stuff that's out in display, if you look at some of the older collections, you look at the feathers, they're kind of in bad shape and they're starting to degrade because UV does a, does a real number on feathers. And so what we did to try to understand the evolution of this uh, of pre-alternate molt was we kind of did a shotgun approach and we got data for everything we could about, about warblers. So like where they breed, their body mass, the extent of pre-alternate molt, whether males and females look different, where they put their nests, what kind of nests they have, what shape their nests are, um, the precipitation where they breed, where they winter, the temperature where they breed, they just like everything we could, we could about these birds. And then we started to whittle it down. Like, okay, which of these things are related to each other? Which of these things are related to molt? And we basically kind of use complicated analyses to start making and ranking models that make the most sense. Um, and then we conducted what's called a phylogenetic path analysis. So when we had these models, you've heard probably correlation doesn't equal causation, right? Um, and that's where we're at with the phylogenetic mixed models. So we have, okay, this thing's related to this thing. We moved on to path analysis, which is kind of cool because it can start to parse out correlation and causation by being able to let sort of a daughter variable have multiple parent variables and you could look at the pathways between different variables um, and start to parse causation out of your correlations, which is really neat. And, and here's our strongest path model, was that migrant, was that pre-alternate molt seems to evolve in response to, to longer days, um, which are a result of longer distance migration. And then once pre-alternate molt exists, it can serve as a platform for color change. So pre-alternate molt doesn't necessarily respond, evolve in response to needs for color changes, but once it exists, it can serve for color change. And color change seems to evolve in response, at least partly to foraging stratum. So birds on the canopy seem to change their colors more than birds that live in the undergrowth. So, how does how do these differences in breeding and non-breeding evolve? Um, what's the mechanism? Is it these differential selective pressures? We find that no. In fact, these differential selective pressures don't seem to be strong enough on their own to influence the evolution of molt strategies. Instead, it seems to be slightly more complicated model where birds evolve long distance migration. Because they have long distance migration, they're more exposed to uh, feather wear via solar exposure. They evolve a pre-alternate molt so they molt twice a year because they have to replace their weather, their feathers more frequently because they wear more often. And then because they molt twice a year, they're able to change colors in response to the selection that we were talking about. So it's not that the selection's not there and it's not that the selection isn't influencing, uh, sorry, the differences in selection aren't influencing the feather color. It's that they're not necessarily causing the evolution of, of the molt strategies. And one thing to point out is that we also found that this pathway is reversible um, with response to plumage aspects. So it's not just birds gaining 
uh, bright color. Um, we, lots of birds have lost, lots of warblers have lost uh, evolu um, migratory behavior over evolutionary time. In fact, it seems like most resident warblers have evolved from migratory warblers. And we see the same thing. So when these birds lose long distance migration and, and lose this increased solar exposure, they tend to lose pre alternate molt. So you would think if it's these differences in selection throughout the year, they would keep pre alternate molt, but, but they don't. They, they lose that pre alternate molt and they're, they're stuck in one plumage throughout the year. And it's reversible in uh, with respect to change in color. So it's not just birds gaining pre alternate molt, it's also loss. And when you look at tropical birds, tropical warblers especially, they tend to fall into two categories, right? Where they're just like bright all year, like the red warbler, which is amazing, or they're dull all year, like a, a, like a three-striped warbler, which is pretty cryptic. You don't get these chestnut-sided warblers, which are dull part of the year and bright part of the year. So they're sort of forced to choose. <clears throat> Some birds outside this group take a, a shortcut. So instead of molting, they, they wear feathers. So they grow feathers with a dull tips. So like blackbirds do this, house sparrows, long spurs, and then those dull tips wear off throughout the year and they get this nice bright shiny plumage during breeding season. Um, that's kind of one shortcut birds have taken to avoid having to molt twice a year. And um, before I move on really quickly, I want to point out there's a few species, a lot of birds do pre-alternate molt, um, but very few do a complete pre-alternate molt. So I was looking at extent of pre-alternate molt earlier, right? Like birds that do migrate farther, they molt more feathers. There's only three species that we know of that do a complete pre-alternate molt. So they replace every single feather on their body twice a year. And that's Bobolink, Franklin's gull, and willow warbler. And all three of those are birds that migrate long distance and they spend a lot of time out in the open. So yeah, Bobolink, Franklin's gull, and winter willow warbler are birds that breed in open grasslands and winter in, in the desert mainly. Although Bobolink's kind of winter in open uh, wet grasslands. Um, but they're, they're exposed to sun throughout the year. Um, so that's kind of a little more evidence about how, how and why pre-alternate mold evolves, um, which we think is pretty cool. Anyway, moving on. Just got that. <laughs> the next chapter I'll talk about, or the next part I'll talk about has to do with pace mold. And, and this um, from another chapter from my dissertation that came out in the AUK, which is now called it was the AUK, then it was the AUK Ornithological Advances, and now it's just called Ornithology. Uh, so I got a paper there while it was still the AUK and before it got changed to Ornithology. Not, not that I'm necessarily against it, but it was cool because um, I like the AUK, I don't know, it's a nice name. Um, having to do with feather growth rate and, uh, and how it changes over large geographic uh, regions. And this has to do with life history evolution. And, and I just kind of want to establish what I mean when I talk about life history. The study of life history is really just asking how organisms answer this question. How much time and energy should I invest per year in reproduction versus my own survival in order to maximize lifetime fitness? So some animals invest a lot in reproduction, you know, they scored out 100,000 babies and very little in their own survival, right? So they maybe only live one year, but they, you know, they shoot their gametes everywhere. Whereas some animals invest very little in re reproduction per, per year. So maybe they only breed once every five or 10 or 20 years, but a lot in their adult survival. So they may live 100 years, right? So that balance and where organisms fall on that spectrum, that's the study of life history. And so this chapter has to do with how molt fits into that, that problem. Because molt is the really the main investment that birds make in their own survival every year. So in general, high altitude birds, high latitude birds, sorry, um, tend to be shorter lived. They tend to invest more in reproduction per attempt. So they tend to have larger clutch sizes and they tend to have a shorter breeding season. Whereas lower latitude tropical birds tend to be longer lived tend to invest less in reproduction per attempt. So they had smaller clutch sizes and they're more willing to give up on a clutch um, if there's a predator or, um, or if there's not enough food. And they tend to live in areas with year long productivity. So how does that fit in with mold? 
Uh, investment in reproduction has been really well studied. So this map is just a map of average clutch size of all birds across the world. So you can see in general, tropical birds have about two eggs per clutch, whereas high Arctic birds have al almost five eggs per clutch. Um, but it hasn't been studied really at all in molt, and molt is birds' main annual investment in adult survival. I don't want to say it hasn't been studied at all. It hasn't been studied very much. Anecdotally, if we just look at a couple species, one of the shortest molts we know of is in the snow bunting, uh, where one bird can undergo a molt in under a month, and the whole population may molt in under 45 days up in the high Arctic before they migrate. And the longest molt that we know of is in, in Pythes albifrons, the white plumed ant bird, which is this really cool little ant following bird of uh, northern Amazonia, northern and western Amazonia, um, where one individual could take 300 days to molt and the whole population, you know, there's like no day. This data is from Eric Johnson, who has been doing long-term banding in Brazil in collaboration with his lab for years, and they've never, you know, there's never been a day they were there where the white plumed ant birds weren't molting. Um, so they tend to have really long protracted molts. Uh, so my guess was that feather growth itself might accelerate with increased latitude, either from decreased investment in feather quality. So feathers that grow faster are lower quality. So if a bird is investing less in its own survival, it may grow its feathers faster um, or increased seasonality of, of available food. So just shorter seasons. My approach was Tyler chronology, which is just um, looking at these bars on feathers, it's basically all trial chronology is, it's, it's looking at feathers. Um, if you see the, the feather on the left, besides the main pattern, which is this kind of dark reddish brown and white tip, um, and if anybody can guess what species this is, um, I don't know, you'll get a thumbs up from me. Um, aside from that pattern, you can see there are these sort of dark and light pairs of bars and, and those are called growth bars and, and, and they happen because feathers grow slightly differently during the day and night. And so each pair of bars, each light and dark bar is 24 hours of growth. And so you can just measure those bars and know how quickly a feather grew. You measure 10 of them and say, okay, that's how much feather grew over 10 days. And that's what telechronology is. It's just measuring how fast feathers grew using these growth bars. And I, oh, there's a, there's a big hint right there. So I, Traveled to a bunch of museums throughout the US. In fact, came, this is while I was in Louisiana as well as at LSU um, and, and Kimball kindly hosted me at the LA County Museum um, and Linnea and Renee kindly hosted me at the Western Foundation. Went lots of other places. This picture was at the Smithsonian or the American Museum and uh, just measured thousands and thousands of birds. And these are the results. So. One thing is I measured resident tropical birds, so I knew that they grew their feathers close to where they were collected. And I found consistently that feather growth rate does indeed increase with latitude. And all four species, pretty consistently, the farther you move from the equator, the faster the feathers grow. Some other things that could potentially confound this are body mass. So do bigger birds grow their feathers faster? Uh, among or between species? Yes, bigger birds do grow their feathers faster. But within species, there's no relationship at all. So it's not just body size, or it's not body size at all. Um, so what are the mechanisms that could cause this pattern, that could cause birds to grow their feathers faster as they move away from the equator? Could be an adaptation to increasingly seasonal resources. Um, so here's a bunch of variables, for example, differences in um, you know, hot and cold throughout the day, throughout the year, or the temperature of the coldest night these bioclimatic variables may influence feather growth rate. So I looked at the relationships between these bioclimatic variables and feather growth rate. And these were the five top ones that popped out and they all do have to do with seasonality. So certainly could be seasonality, but it's kind of hard to parse. So I, f I found that feather growth rate does increase with latitude, but the implications are still potentially fuzzy. It could be from increased seasonality. It could be a decreased investment in adult survival. I didn't go into it too much, but we do know that when a feather is grown more slowly, it is more sturdy. And if it's grown more quickly, it's less sturdy. So it could just be more investment in adult survival towards the equator, or it could be something entirely different. It could be that feathers are tied to basal metabolic rate, which we know uh, changes with latitude. So that's still an open question as to exactly what the mechanism for this pattern is, but the pattern seems to be really consistent.
Okay, next part has to do with molt migration, um, which is one of my current projects at, at Occidental at the Moore Lab. Uh, my other current project is the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project, which doesn't have much to do with molt, and so I won't be talking about it today, but it's super cool. If you have any questions about it, you can ask me, we also uh, have a, a really neat interactive website for it. Um, and I've been, these are some of my, these are my collaborators, especially my, uh, my boss and advisor, John McCormack there um, on this project. So specifically here, I'm looking at molt in the, the Mexican monsoon. And so molt migration in the Mexican monsoon generally occurs in birds that breed in the West, like this bullock's oriole, um, that molt just after breeding. So just about all migratory birds molt just after breeding, which is late summer, early fall. And all of us Californians are well acquainted with uh, how dry it is during that, that time of year, right? That's really the driest season. So birds breed, they're ready to molt, and poof, it's fire season. There's like, there's no food because there's been no rain, so there's no bugs. So what they do is they fly to the monsoonal region, uh, which is the west slope of the Cordillera Occidental in Mexico, um, sort of from Oaxaca all the way up through almost southwestern Colorado, but we, we know it well in like southeastern Arizona in the month, you know, in August and September. And they undergo molt there. They stop, they molt, then they continue to where they winter. And just to show you, Payne and Bonting is a classic molt migrant. This is the eBird map. So January, March, here's spring migration. This is where they breed. And you see they're kind of in two different populations. There's the main population in the West, and then there's these ones that breed in the, um, the Sand Hill population. It's like the East Georgia ones. They winter in Florida, Southern Florida mainly. But if you look at these Western ones, oh, I guess I have to, okay. So if you look at these Western ones in the fall, they disappear from the breeding range, but you see they all go West here this is october so they're not on the wintering range yet they're pretty much in this gray area where people don't bird but you can see all this purple here they've all gone from louisiana and arkansas and stuff and they've packed in on the west slope of mexico and what they're doing there's molting and then as fall migration continues then they move down to their wintering grounds in the isthmus of tuantepec and guatemala belize um, and the yucatan and, and those areas so my questions with this project are, which populations are using the monsoon to molt? Is every single individual of each species doing this? Or is it just different parts of different populations that are relying on the monsoon? And how's climate change affecting the space use and the, the phenology of molt migration? And I didn't, sorry, the phenology is jargon, but phenology just means the timing of an event or the timing of a biological event. Molt is energetically expensive, right? And migratory birds, they plan their annual cycles around when they can obtain resources to molt. These birds fly hundreds or thousands of miles to get to the monsoon at the right place at the right time to get food to molt. Um, and here's just kind of an example of what it looks like. Hope, hopefully a bunch of you who've seen monsoons, um, maybe been to Arizona in the late summer, early fall, they're really spectacular. They're mainly these big pop-up thunderstorms that rain like crazy. Um, and the monsoon region, they... <clears throat> Monsoon regions receive the vast majority of their annual rainfall during the monsoon. So these are areas that are deserts, you know, mostly the year. And then during the monsoon, they receive 90% of their rainfall or more. They receive a huge amount of rainfall. So they're really, really lush for like two months and then they're desert the rest of the year. Um, sorry, just these are just going back to the main questions. So how might climate change be affecting this? system. Well, we know that the monsoon is getting later in the year from climate change with global warming. Um, so these plots are just the average rainfall in the monsoon. You can see in June and July, it's going down. September, it's going up. October, it's going up. Monsoon, the monsoon is moving from a June, July, August phenomenon into a August, September, and even um, October phenomenon. So it is, it is shifting later in the year over the past hundred years since industrialization. So I wanted to know if birds are shifting their molt timing later in the year with monsoon. Um, and I, I based this study mainly on two really large, really cool, unique collections, our collection of birds from, Mexican, uh, from Mexico at the Moore Lab, uh, which is about 40,000 specimens from Mexico. 
that were, and it's really important, they were collected between 1932 and 1953. So these are birds that are 90 years old now. Um, and the University of Washington's Birth Museum, which has more modern specimens, they were prepared with these really nice spread wings. So I was able to assess them all really well. Um, and we're at the Moore Lab actually, I imagine some of you know this, some probably don't, a lot of people on campus don't. We're actually the largest collection of, of uh, Mexican bird specimens in the entire world. And it was from this collection that was made between the 30s and 50s. Um, I also did some field work, um, got to work in New Mexico and down in Sonora. Um, took two trips to Sonora, would have taken more if we couldn't, uh, if we could travel more. Um, both really cool places. Just to give you an example, you know, I talked about how all the punt painted bunnings are packed in there in October. This is what it's like. And this, these were two birds out of a field of hundreds and hundreds of painted buntings. And every single one looked like this, you know, they're just like hideous with molt. So they're all packed in there, like the whole population, and they're all molting. So when we look at the pre-basic molt, uh, so the dots are just molt. So the bottom is hasn't started molt yet. Top is has completed molt yet. And then the x-axis is time. So when we line up molt, it seems to start just around or before the peak of rainfall and finishes right around the end of the monsoon. So the blue is monthly rainfall. So when we look at the data for 14 species that are of molt migrants that I was able to get decent samples for, um, we parse that down just to these six species that we had good historical and modern samples for. And we, found, we find no evidence at all that these birds are able to, to vary their molt timing, um, which is potentially really concerning. So these birds are molting right now pretty much the same time they were molting 90 years ago, right when this climate change was starting, when the monsoon was on average about three weeks earlier. But these models were made here, I'll show you, um, just with birds in active molt. So we, we fit you know, a linear model, essentially it's not quite a linear model, but it's close to birds in active molt. But if you think, you, know, you see a bird with really worn feathers, you know, okay, it hasn't started molt yet. Or if you see a bird with really nice feathers, you know, okay, it has molted yet. And so we wanted to develop some models that could take those into account to better inform when molt starts and, and finishes. We should be able to use those birds. And so I worked with um, Yi Fang, who's a, a biostatistician, biostatistician uh, at the University of Washington, um, and uh, Jared Wolf and Amanda Zelma right here at Oxy to develop this new mathematical model called a double hinge threshold model, which really can take birds that haven't molted yet, birds that have finished molt, and birds that are in active molt, and look for the change points and model fit to try to figure out where molt started and finished. So similar to last, the last models, but can use non-molting birds to inform that. This is what it looks like when it's fit to the painted bunting um, data. Works really well. So we're working on a publish on a paper publishing this model, but also comparing it to existing models. And this seems to work really well, especially with smaller sample sizes. You need really big sample sizes for the other models, whereas this model works pretty well with, with smaller sample sizes and you can incorporate non-molting birds. Um, so we are now applying those to the data set and we should have better data from a lot more species of birds really soon, which I'm really excited about and wrapping up pretty much right now. Um, Something to point out though is just before the monsoon is the driest time of year, right? Like it's coldest just before the dawn. Just before the monsoon, it's the longest it's been since it's rained. So if a bird gets there to molt and the monsoon hasn't started yet, it's actually really dry and really foodless. And this isn't trivial. Um, you might think, oh, a bird, an individual bird can delay molt. And there's actually been experiments on this. And the evidence is that no, birds probably can't. Um, there's been experiments where birds were um, not given enough food to molt to see if they would delay their molt and they don't. They just molt anyway. They grow really crappy feathers and like some of them even died in one experiment. It seems like, you know, when, when molt time is there, it's time to molt. Um, when molt happens can vary over evolutionary time, but it doesn't seem to be able to vary within an individual. So this really could be a big problem. And in fact, this last year when we saw that this big die off of birds in New Mexico, that was during the fall. And that was a lot of species that are mole migrants. We don't know exactly why it happened, but the species that were brought in were all malnourished. They all had very little food. I don't know if they're actively molting. I haven't looked at the specimens, but 
it seems to be there's a scenario where these birds may be getting to the molting grounds, starting molt, and they don't have enough food to molt. They don't have enough food to survive while molting. Um, and, and, and this could be potentially really bad for these birds. Uh, we do see different things going on with the data. We see bimodal, pat bimodal patterns. So, you know, this group of birds molting, this group of birds molting. And we want to know if these birds are from different populations, going back to the original questions. So, for example, chipping sparrows are a molt migrant. Um, and I talk about Western birds undergoing molt migration, Eastern birds not. Well, chipping sparrows molt dang near everywhere, right? So is it every single chipping sparrow on earth is going to the monsoon molt? Or is it just some populations? Specifically, is it just Western populations? Um, and so what we're doing is we're using a genomic approach, like in this paper from Kristen Rudd, looking at Wilson's warblers, where she and her group sequenced birds on the breeding grounds and on the wintering grounds to separate the populations and find out where the wintering, where the birds were wintering. So they, they found the Western birds tend to winter in West Mexico and Baja, the Northern birds tend to winter in, towards the Isthmus and the Eastern birds tend to winter in the Yucatan and, um, and Central America. So we are taking a similar approach, but instead of asking where the birds winter, we wanna ask where, where they molt and how reliant they are on the monsoon. So we're using genetic techniques. We're using, uh, we're amplifying ancient DNA from these 90 year old specimens, comparing it to modern DNA to ask which populations are and aren't reliant on the monsoon. Um, we've so far had really good luck extracting uh, a lot of DNA from a lot of specimens. Um, we've gotten really good recount, you know, so for, these are just lark sparrows from 33 to 54. So again, this is a bird that's been sitting in the door for 90 years and we were able to get a little bit of uh, tissue off and you know these birds were getting an average of uh, you know uh, three million breeds you know per per individual. So it's great. Uh, we're working with some new techniques that have been developed recently using really gnarly and dangerous chemicals. Um, so how's climate change affecting species and phenology mold migration in the Mexican monsoon? The birds may not be adjusting their molt phenology, so when they molt. Uh, but we need to understand more about the population structure, which birds are doing this to be sure, and which populations are using the monsoon to molt. We're working on it. We should have an answer soon. We have a ton of DNA extracted and uh, a lot of it sequenced. Hopefully we should finish sequencing it soon and have some good answers. So why do different birds have different strategies for molting their feathers? Just kind of wrapping it back up, going back to this original question. And what are the effects and consequences of these molt strategies? Why do different birds have different strategies for molting their feathers? Well, it seems that they have different strategies for molting their feathers because different birds, they have different life histories, so they live their lives in different ways. And so they have different needs for their feathers that do different things. And they have different access to resources for molting their feathers. And what are the effects and consequences of these molt strategies? Well, I, I think I've found in my research that molt strategies can have potentially really profound effects on birds' body plans, like whether or not they fly, their evolutionary trajectories, um, like whether or not they have a different plumage in the breeding and non-breeding uh, season and the life histories of birds. So how, how they invest in their own survival, how and when they invest in their own survival and, and reproduction. So what can feather molt tell us about the evolution of birds? A lot, I think. And with that, um, I've got acknowledgements. I won't read them because they're near endless. And I'll just say working on the evolution of molt in birds has been like a dream of mine. And I've been incredibly privileged to be able to do it and be able to work at a place that I love and that supports me. And uh, I hope that that we can all do what we can to um, uh, live in a country and be in a country where everybody has the same access to live, live out their dreams. Um, and unfortunately we currently don't, but hopefully in the future we can. And, uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Absolutely. And actually, uh, Ryan, we have lots of questions. Wow. Uh, in the q and I don't know if you have access. Do you, would you like us to read the questions to you, or would you like to go through How them? How about, would you mind reading them to me? That might that Not might... at all. Not at all. Uh, first question we have is from Ira Blitz. At what point in feather evolution did molting appear? Short answer is we don't really know, but I would guess that molt <clears throat> evolved along with feathers because feathers, you know, if an animal grows a feather, 
that feather is going to wear no matter what. And it's hard to imagine a dinosaur growing a feather that just wears and goes away. Although maybe baby dinosaurs, you know, grew feathers and then they just wore and, and were never replaced. And then the adults didn't have feathers. I can imagine that. Um, so short answer, I don't know. Long answer, probably, <laughs> probably pretty quickly after. It, 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 certainly as soon as animals were using feathers as adults. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I understand this, but from an anonymous attendee, how long do flightless birds stay flightless? Yeah. So I talked about temporarily flightless birds. So birds that are flightless just during molt. So all grebes, all loons, all waterfowl. This is usually about, I talked about the shortest molt in birds <coughs> is a snow bunny, which is like 28 days. So these birds are maybe about twice that. So it's about a month and a half, maybe, maybe two months. Um, that that they're flightless so while so they do need to they certainly need to eat they can't fast while they're molting mm -hmm. and then the birds that I talk about that are fully flightless are just oh. yeah. yeah sounds good uh, next question from Walt Sakai uh, since replacement of feathers is simultaneous molt oh excuse me uh, I can't speak since replacement of feathers and simultaneous molt requires high resource requirements evolution should occur where there is high resource availability eg would not simultaneous molt to occur in de would not simultaneous molt occur in deserts uh, would they occur in polar regions for example yeah, it's a really good point. Um, first is that surprisingly, um, and, and this isn't intuitive, but the little bit of research that there has been has found that simultaneous swimming molt doesn't seem to require any more energy than non-simultaneous swimming molt, which is weird yeah. because they're growing all their feathers at once. <laughs> but the research into the energetics of, for example, ducks that are doing simultaneous swimming molt have found that their energetic requirements <coughs> Are pretty much the same as any other molting bird. That said, it does seem that simultaneous wing molt does occur where there's easy access, right? Whether where food is like right there. So birds, um, especially waterfowl, will do molt migrations where they go to a lake where there's lots of birds. Um, but there are birds with simultaneous wing molt in the desert. For example, flamingos, like lesser flamingos in Africa will do simultaneous wing molt. But again, it's on a salt plain where there's like lots and lots of food right there at their feet. So um, so kind of yes and no. It doesn't seem like simultaneous wing molt requires a lot more food than any other uh, molt, um, but it, it certainly does have to do with access to resources. Great, great. Uh, next question from Bella Liu or Bella Liu. Uh, I'm, I apologize, Bella, if I, for mispronouncing your name. A lot more birds with partial pre-alternate molds seem to mold head feathers more than, say, secondaries. Besides UV radiation, could another possible ex explanation be how small head feathers are? Since they could expend less energy to change the same patch of color? Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's a, a really good point that I didn't get into. Um, and especially when you think about preformative molt, which is the first molt that birds do, a lot of that is just body feathers and not necessarily the big the big remedy. So part of the reason we really thought it was UV was because um, was comparing the head to the back and the underparts and the coverts and other similarly sized small feathers. So I kind of drilled into the body feathers versus wing feathers to sort of make a point, but you, you've really hit on the more fine point of it, um, which is that, yeah, energetics really do come into it. So Within that, we still did find good support for the UV hypothesis, but that that's a really good point that that um, that you yeah, Bella you there. Yeah, yeah, great, great, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next question from John Dunn: Why are there different mold strategies within the Dunland, the Greenland, and European subspecies? Um, excuse me for mispronunciation. Arctica, Skinzi, and Alfina. Alpina migrate south and partway south before their 
pre-basic molt, while Asian and North American subspecies stay north for their pre-basic molt. Why are the uh, what are the taxonomic uh, implications? Well, that, that's a really good question. Um, the short answer is I, I don't know if there's necessarily a known answer um, or a, a good research-based answer. My intuitive guess is that it has to do with the distribution of food. So the, the Greenland and European subspecies may just breed in areas that don't have a lot of food post-breeding, or they are the evolutionary descendants of birds that lived in areas that didn't have a lot of food post-breeding. So maybe they have food now, but their ancestors didn't and they evolved that strategy. So who knows? As far as the taxonomic implications, that's, a, that's another really good question and something that I am hoping to get into soon. So what John's getting at here is that, you know, some populations of birds live their life differently. So, you know, if a bird, if a Dunlin from North America breed, you know, that does molt on its breeding grounds, breeds with a, a Dunlin from Europe that does molt on the winter grounds, the offspring might try to molt in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? So do these different molt strategies act as some sort of barrier to interbreeding? And so, and does that give us any information about whether they, about where they are along the process of speciation or does it even have evolutionary implications for the process of speciation? We have no idea, but that's actually, that's a direction I'm currently trying to steer my research into because I think it's a, a really good one. Uh... I, I'll, I can actually, I have the Q&A open, so I'll just go ahead and I'll answer John's next couple well, questions. I'll... Well, be, before you jump to that, Alvaro Jaramillo um, put into the chat that is hypothesized that Dunlin and North America are holding off on migration to, vo migration to avoid migrating down with peregrines. Hmm. You either migrate early and molt later to avoid peregrines or you hold in, mass up, and migrate later. I think the paper is by Dove Lank et al. Cool. Yeah, I didn't know about that, but that really makes sense. And European and Greenland Dunlins migrate a lot earlier than our, our Dunlins. We, you know, we don't see Dunlins until October or something, but when the old world Dunlins show up in August. In fact, I saw a Dunlin in Louisiana in August once, and I've well, it's, it's probably a European one, unless it was an over over summering bird. Um, so yeah, it could also have to do with the difference in the migratory timing, which that's really cool, Alvaro. Thanks. Sure. I, I don't know about that uh, that peregrine hypothesis. Sure. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I'm gonna, I'll just answer John's other two questions since I'm trying. Sure. To, also, species of willow warbler have two molts based on limited knowledge. Springy acutensis is pretty dull and gray. To my knowledge, yes, but I don't know. But um, the thing about willow warblers and kind of the one of one of the main points I was trying to drive home is that in them, the alternate and basic plumage are nearly identical. And so it doesn't seem to be molt in response to needing to have different colors. It seems to be molt in response to feather wear. Um, you know, bobolink does change colors completely. Franklin's gull partially, even though they molt all their feathers, only some of them look differently. Whereas willow warblers, they're their breeding and non-breeding plumages are, are really similar. Um, and then John also said, when I was in Central and Southeastern Oklahoma, I saw dozens of palliator painted bunnings. All but one were gray juveniles, the adults would fly. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's really the adults doing this, uh, um, this molt migration. And, and we, when I showed all the molt timing stuff, that was, that was just adults because the juveniles, they actually have to do two molts in that same time. So understanding how and when they, they molt is, is um, a different a different beast. Um, okay, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Ron. Okay, from Bella again. What advantages does using DNA have over banding in terms of discovering where birds are coming from? That's a great question. And banding and using genetics both have really, you know, both have advantages and disadvantages. And we've learned a lot about molt monsoon from banding studies. One cool thing about genetics is we can identify just about every bird. So with banding, you know, especially with migratory birds, you gotta ban a lot of birds and hope you catch, you get one back. 
now that we have better technology, we can start to put GPS tags on birds, but we still don't have GPS tags that are small enough to put on most of these mole migrants. Although we, we will soon, there's a new satellite that's been launched called Icarus um, that can detect GPS tags that are, that are pretty small. But um, using DNA, we can identify where birds came from, basically every individual, and we can identify these birds that were collected, you know, back in the 1930s or something. So we have access to a, a, a lot of birds in the museum that we can use to inform uh, these studies. And, and it's one cool thing about museums, you know, these birds are in these in cases for research. And one of our kind of philosophies working in the museum is trying to make these birds as useful as possible. And so um, we're using them, you know, these birds were collected 30 years before uh, Rosalind Franklin even discovered DNA. Um, you know, people had no idea what DNA even was. And so it's pretty cool that we're using these individuals um, for genetic studies. Cool. Very cool. Uh, from Lance Benner, could you please bring up this slide that showed the flightless birds and their mold categories? It was early in the talk. This one? Oh, I'm not, I don't think I'm, oh, I am sharing my screen. I think it was this yeah. one. Yeah. I don't think Lance can speak. So um, here you go. <laughs> or maybe he's in the, the chat yeah pop something in the in the chat lance so we know that we're on the correct screen and while lance is doing that lord singh asks when do morning doves and other birds that sometimes breed year round usually molt yeah, so any individual tends to molt just after it's it breeds. So birds that breed year round, um, you know, when we talk about year round breeding, it's not one individual <coughs> breeding all year. Individuals are staggered kind of throughout the year. And so any individual that breeds then tends to molt sort of um, just after that. So they also have year round molt in the same way they have year round breeding, but the individual isn't molting year round. It's kind of staggered. But one interesting thing, caveat to that is that molt and breeding are usually not overlapped, especially as you move away from the equator. So migratory birds, they really don't molt and they don't breed and molt at the same time. But as you get more into the tropics, when breeding gets more protracted and more year round, molt gets more protracted and tends to start overlapping a little bit more with breeding, um, which is a interesting phenomenon that we're still trying to understand. Hmm. Thank you. Again, from Alvaro. Um, other than long-tailed ducks, is there any other bird that molts between one fancy plumage to another fancy plumage? Although one plumage is browner than the other, both male, uh, excuse me, both male plumages have the long tail and striking patterns. So to me, they both seem to be fancy or display plumages unlike most birds. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I I mean, I know a lot of birds that molt between a dull plumage and another dull plumage, but you know what we think of as fancy or dull may not necessarily reflect what birds think of as fancy. So it may not necessarily reflect the trade-off between sexual selection and and camouflage and feathers. Um, but that said, you know, ducks are kind of an interesting example where they their plumage that they're using for breeding. Is sort of decoupled in time from the actual breeding so that most ducks tend to pair up in the winter i don't know if long-tailed ducks necessarily do although i i, I assume they do because i think most ducks do so that's why has to do with why ducks in the winter are bright and colorful and then they have that dull eclipse plumage when they're actually breeding because the colorful plumage is more about pairing up not necessarily breeding alvaro's asking about something different they go from a colorful plumage to another colorful mm -hmm. plumage that I don't know, but I'm guessing it may have something to do with their, their uh, breeding system and their pair bonding, maybe. It also may just be, you know, that nice pretty white plumage is because they're, you know, high up in the Arctic and they're near snow or something. Why they still have that long tail, I don't know. Although, I don't know if the rectrices are necessarily replaced twice. I think that long tail may just be the same plumage all year, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Alvaro probably knows. <laughs> <laughs> Um, again, going to, uh, actually, before we leave this slide, uh, Lance did ask what, uh, what's up with barn owl? 
and Barn Owl. I'm, not, I'm yeah. not sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So there were, I put here two. Um, there was one for sure and one probably flightless Barn Owl. Um, one of them was called Tito Pollens or the Chick Charney, which is um, in the Bahamas. And it was a, it was a Tito, it was Tito Pollens, and it was about four feet tall and had these huge legs, it was terrestrial, and it was just like this big, flightless, terrestrial predator, <laughs> barn owl in the Bahamas. It was super awesome. It's one of my favorite fossils, and it was, you know, of course, went extinct as soon as humans got there. Um, yeah. And it was so cool. And it, in fact, still exists in the, um, the verbal culture of of uh, indigenous Bahamian people. Um, they call it Chick Charney. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay, moving along. Um, I see that you start to look at Richard Chimino's uh, question, and this is going back to the D photo. Yeah. So that and... is a, it's a Cotinga. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's uh, shrike like Laniosoma. I'm not 100% sure that that's the species because there's a couple species like that. Um, and they they appear to, I forget the, num the name of the caterpillar, but this species, the paper that documents this, I, I should pull it up, but it shows the caterpillar and it's like exactly like that. And then in fact, they introduced a fake predator to the nest and the babies, they start, they do this like movement <laughs> display that looks just like, <laughs> it's something so cool. Can I speak to the multi-strategy yield bull magpie? Uh, I don't know anything special about their mole in relation to uh, any other um, corvid. So uh, I wish I could, um, but you know, they seem to, they, I think they just have a, a pre-basic and a pre-formative mole, no pre-alternate, and then, and then do a um, uh, sequential primary mole. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, next question for Mark O. Since molt is hormon hormonally med mediated, I, I'm not even saying it correctly, hormonally mediated and hormonal concentrations depend largely on day slash night cycles, wouldn't that in itself stabilize molt timing? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I mean, so molt timing is stable. You know, if we talk about when molt happens, um, molt is really predictable year to year in species, um, the hormones that molt rely on are not day night necessarily hormones. They're more annual cycle hormones. So they're, so especially testosterone. So testosterone, when it drops after breeding seems to set off a cascade that um, triggers molt that especially involves uh, prolactin and um, luteinizing hormone. And those are hormones that vary more on an annual or throughout the year cycle than, than uh, day night cycles. Oh, cool. Next question, again, from an anonymous attendee. What are the reasons for a breeding plumage mold in birds that don't migrate or don't live or breed at high altitudes? For example, mallards. That's a great question. And I kind of want to um, make a point that, that we found that breeding plumage evolves in response to feather wear in warblers. Um, we didn't look at all birds. And in fact, I don't think that's the case in all birds. I think it's probably the case in a lot of birds, um, but there are a number of birds. Um, so mallards are an example, although I think a, a better example or another good example might be ptarmigans, right? Ptarmigans mm -hmm. mold three times a year. And it's cl clearly because they're trying to match their color background, right? And this, the winter it's snowy and they're white. And then in the fall, it's partially snowy and they're brown and white. And then in the summer, it's rocky and they're brown, right? They clearly are responding to differential needs for feather color. So I think a lot of preoperative and a lot of species has more to do with feather wear than needs for color change. But I don't think I'm not saying that that is universal. And in fact, there's some cases where that is, you know, doesn't doesn't pass the sniff test at all. Okay. And I see John Dunn has a ptarmigan question also. Um, his question simply is, don't ptarmigan have three molds? Um, so yeah, they want... don't. I just <laughs> go over that for, uh, I don't know, flow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
this uh, next question is from Lily. And Lily asks, what are the dy dynamics go for birds that undergo catastrophic molts? That go for birds that undergo catastrophic molts? I'm not sure exactly what uh, that question is specifically about, but you know, when birds undergo these catastrophic or simultaneous molts, they you know they molt all their wing feathers at once, and they're you know they're totally flightless, and a lot of times they even atrophy their their pectoralis muscle, so like grebes, ear grebes, with the whole thing. yeah, they'll just like lose all their muscle, and then grow it back again, and that kind of speaks to how why birds lose flight because that muscle is really expensive even just to maintain. Wow, wow. Okay, next question from Gre Gregory Hatch Hatchigian. Hatchigian. Do birds see some colors in the UV range that we do not notice between molts? Yes, absolutely. And that's uh, something we're working towards. So we didn't incorporate changes in UV in the Warbler paper, which if we went back and did it, would be a cool thing to do. Um, there are new or methods for uh, incorporating UV and, and avian color space. So, you know, we have like a three dimensional color space we see in and birds have a, have a four dimensional color space that they see in um, because they can see in the UV because they have that extra cone. And so there are new techniques for looking at, at coloration in that four dimensional space instead of our three dimensional space. Um, and that, that, that's a very good question. We didn't look at it in the warblers, but it, it's certainly something that um, is, is, is probable. Almost certain. Almost certain. Uh, next question is kind of a statement, I guess, from John LaBelle. And I I think I'm going to hand it over to you because... Um... Uh, yeah. So it's the Cenarius Mourner and Brazilian Laniosoma, which I said shrike-like Laniosoma, I think it's... So shrike-like Cotinga, shrike-like Laniosoma is sometimes split into Brazilian and Peruvian. I, the, there's the population in, in the Atlantic Forest of Brazil and then the population in the Andes. Um, and so that was either scenarios Warner or or Land or Soma. Um, oh, so that is that's actually uh, this is down in the weeds, but that's actually the second paper from this series. And the so that's not the paper that I I don't think that I took that caption from, but that doesn't matter. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, another anonymous attendee asks: Does the timing of pre-alternate molt in ruddy ducks? have to do a lot with feather wear. Probably. We have, I'd really like to, now that we looked at warblers, I'd like to look at ducks and especially shorebirds because um, both ducks and shorebirds have a lot of variation in migratory behavior, coloration, um, and have the variation and extent of pre-alternate molts. And so that would be a really cool, cool way to go forward for it. So yeah, I think probably, but we don't, we don't know. You don't know. Next question. What do you think about Steve Howell's book? Love <laughs> no, no. The question is, did you find Howell's book on Molt helpful? Yeah, I I love it. I think it's a great book. And there's actually an. I guess I'm not plugging it because I had nothing to do with it. But this is a book <laughs> that called "The Biology of Molten Birds" that I also mm. think is just stellar. It's, it, if anybody's interested in molt, I highly recommend Steve's book on molten North American birds. And I also really highly recommend this book by, by Jenny and Winkler on the biology of molten birds. Um, it is just, it's outstanding. Yeah, and Steve Howell's book, uh, Molten North American Birds, is in the Peterson Reference Guides, if anyone wasn't aware of that. And finally, Mary Freeman asks also, I saw a few red knots at Bolsa Chica, I think midsummer. They were nearly white, and I was told they probably didn't migrate. Did they lose their red coloration at the time by the time I saw them, or did they not go into their breeding coloration? I'm not sure. Yeah, sometimes in the summer, especially a young bird that may have a partial molt, um, may not have. If it was really white, they might be really worn, which means that they might have been basic feathers that that you know they just didn't do the pre-alternate or they hadn't started yet. Although pre-alternate molt usually happens like in the winter and early spring, so. Mm -hmm faded from sitting out in the in the open a uh, long time or they could have been young birds that you know we did a more limited pre-alternate um not sure okay okay um mark am i missing anything 
No, I don't think you're missing anything. I think we uh, covered everything that was in the Q&A. Fantastic. A lot, of, a lot of great questions. Lots. Of, uh, it was a great presentation. And a great presentation, and yes. Thank you very much, questions. Ryan. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, um, I did want to invite every uh, invite everyone to remind everyone of our webinar. We are now having two webinars a month. One um, presented on a, a, a ornithology topic such as molt and all that. Uh, the second one of the month will be based on an ID question. And this month's webinar is on ID questions is set for next Tuesday at seven o'clock. And it's gonna be female hu hummingbirds of California. So um, I hope you tune into that as being presented by Desi Seaberth, who I think works with Ryan also, or had worked with Ryan, isn't yeah, it? I'm writing with Desi right now, and actually on a, um, a molt paper. In Fantastic. Canada. Great. And Desi is the youngest member of the lab board. So um, that which is neither here nor there. I just thought it was interesting. Um, I, so I hope you can join us next Tuesday. Uh, for those receiving a uh, Zoom registration, you will receive it shortly by the end of this week. And um, anything else? Ryan, thank you again for the presentation. It was wonderful. Mark, is there anything that we're missing? else no, that we're missing oh no i don't think we're missing anything and uh calvin gives you two thumbs up that's a good thing thanks everybody it was fun calvin, calvin is a very enthousi enthusiastic lab student nice and uh with that uh i just want to for the final time, thank Ryan for his presentation. And I hope to see all of you, so to speak, next Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Take care. Take care, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs>